Coming up on New Day at Arirang, South Korea projected to see another day with a record number of new COVID-19 cases. Estimates suggesting it could top 50,000 for the first time ever. The rampant spread of the Omicron variant responsible for the overwhelming majority of the infections. A WTO panel upholds many of South Korea's claims against the US in a Trump-era dispute involving American safeguard measures on washing machine imports. The WTO urges Washington to bring the measures in line with global rules. Plus, South Korea wins its first medal at the Beijing Winter Olympics. Speed skater Kim Min Sok winning bronze in the men's 1500 meter final. We have more on that and the rest of the sporting highlights from the Chinese capital. Hello and welcome to this Wednesday edition of New Day at Arirang. It's 8 a.m. February 9th here in Seoul, South Korea. Thank you for joining us. I'm Kim Mogyan. And I'm Art Broom. Over the next hour, we will be taking a look at the biggest news stories of the day and also get expert insights on the issues facing South Korea and the world as well. However, we are going to start with the COVID-19 situation, which is getting increasingly serious by the day. South Korea's daily tally has already surpassed the 40,000 mark even before the day's tally has come out, leaving experts to suggest Wednesday's total could potentially surpass 50,000 when the official numbers come out in around 90 minutes from now. Despite the ongoing surge, quarantine restrictions are being lifted starting today. For more on this, our reporter Choi min -jung is here in the studio with us. Good morning, min -jung. Good morning. So let's start with the local infections. I believe we're expecting a big jump today. Mugen, from midnight to 9 p.m. on Tuesday, the country already saw a record high figure, close to 41,000 cases. And the figure has, was already very close to 50,000 by 11 p.m. So we're expecting to see an all-time high figure exceeding 40,000 and most likely the 50,000 mark for the first time today. The tally jumped by more than 9,000 cases from the previous day, while it has more than doubled compared to a week ago. The capital's hall alone saw more than 10,000 cases for the first time. With the rampant spread of Omicron, the capital has also witnessed cases among students more than double in the last week. According to the Seoul Metropolitan Office of Education, more than 2,700 students from kindergarten to high school seniors contracted the virus in that time. This is up by more than 1,400 cases from the previous week. The increase also comes as many schools in the capital started the new semester in February. We should be bracing for a further uptick in infections, knowing that cases tend to surge following the weekend and a holiday which we recently had for the Lunar New Year. Now, Min Jung, as we mentioned in the opening there, South Korea is starting to lift a lot of restrictions, including uh, the self-isolation uh, rules. What exactly is changing? Right. Um, starting today, the quarantine period for those infected with COVID-19 has been adjusted to seven days regardless of vaccination status. Up to now, patients who are vaccinated had to self-isolate for seven days, and it was 10 days for people who weren't vaccinated. But the authorities have removed the, dis the distinction, and now everyone infected will only have to quarantine for a week. And also, before the revision, quarantine began either on the first day of symptoms or on the day of receiving test results. But now, day one of quarantine starts on the day of the COVID-19 test. Right, so the measures have been eased for COVID-19 patients, but what about those who came to close contact with those who got infected? Well, measures have also been eased for those who made close contact. Previously, these people had to quarantine, but now only unvaccinated people who are living with a person who has tested positive or those who came into contact with a confirmed case at facilities considered vulnerable to infection are required to self-isolate for seven days. This includes nursing hospitals and care facilities. Um, fully vaccinated people who are living with someone who has tested positive or those who made contact at other locations, such as restaurants and cafes, 
workers will not be required to quarantine, but instead will have to abide by prevention measures autonomously, wear masks at all times, and avoid going to places where they might come into contact with vulnerable people. Again, this only applies to those who are fully vaccinated, meaning more than 14 days but less than 90 days have passed since the second shot, or those who have received the booster shot. Okay, rather confusing all the different changes uh, happening, but I suppose that's the age we live in these days. Uh, regarding European countries, many of them are in the process of easing restrictions, or some of them, in fact, have completely lifted restrictions. However, some of them still remain on guard. Right, Mark. Unlike um, other European countries, Germany still remains very cautious. Um, the health minister on Tuesday said the virus situation is not under control yet and warned there would be repercussions if antivirus measures were eased quickly. This comes as Germany is struggling with the Omicron variant as cases reached close to 170,000 on Tuesday. Meanwhile, Hong Kong has imposed the toughest restrictions yet. Starting Thursday, the cap on social gatherings is set to be tightened to two people. Vaccine pass mandates are also being extended to shopping malls and supermarkets, while hair salons and religious facilities will temporarily close. This comes as Hong Kong breaks daily records day after day, with 625 new infections confirmed Tuesday. Meanwhile, New Zealand has also um, forecast a grim milestone. The Prime Minister said the Omicron wave will likely uh, peak in March, with daily cases possibly reaching 30,000. This as the country sees record high numbers of daily infections hovering around the 200 mark for the past several days. All right, Min Jung, thank you for your report. We'll talk to you again soon. Thank you. South Korea has won a World Trade Organization dispute over safeguard measures imposed on washing machines and parts by the U.S. during the former Trump administration. A panel at the agency said Seoul hadn't been violating any of the WTO's rules in the first place. Kim Hyo-sun tells us more. A WTO panel has sided with South Korea in the latest development over U.S.-imposed safeguard measures on washing machine imports. Seoul's trade ministry said Wednesday that the country had won the WTO dispute over the Trump-era safeguard tariffs. It explained a WTO appeals panel stated in a new report that it could not see any violation of WTO rules by South Korea. In May 2018, South Korea launched a complaint three months after the Trump administration began levying a 20 percent tariff on the yearly quota of 1.2 million imported washing machines and a 50 percent tariff on units beyond that. The measure was extended in 2020 for another two years. Watchers saw the measure as largely being aimed at South Korea's Samsung and LG Electronics. The report added Washington failed to clearly demonstrate how the increased imports of South Korean products imposed serious harm to the U.S. industry. Washington can file an appeal within 60 days. If not, the case will be closed within 12 months following relevant steps. Kim Hyo-sun, Arirang News. The U.S. posted a record trade deficit last year as imports increased sharply amid the restocking of shelves by businesses due to high domestic demand, according to the U.S. Commerce Department on Tuesday. The trade deficit rose 27 percent on year in 2021 to an all-time high of more than 800 59 billion U.S. dollars. The deficit was around $676 billion in 2020. The import growth overshadowed a sharp rebound in exports. Goods exports jumped more than 23 percent to a record 1.8 trillion U.S. dollars. Now, the Winter Olympics provides a global stage not only for athletes, but also for international companies looking to spread or strengthen awareness of their brand around the world. But for Beijing 2022, the sponsors are trying to keep as much of a low profile as possible amid US-China tensions, as well as Beijing's well-documented human rights issues. Song Yujin reports. 
With the pandemic making it difficult to watch Beijing 2022 at bars or restaurants, most South Koreans are cheering on Team Korea from home. And to cater for these fans, convenience stores are offering promotions on drinks and snacks. Sports fans' favorite, fried chicken, will also have special deals during the Olympic period. We have prepared a variety of gifts and events for those who watch the Olympics at home. As the number is expected to increase on the back of rising COVID-19 cases and the small time difference with Beijing. However, apart from the food and drink industries, other sectors are lacking the Olympic spirit. On top of the exploding Omicron variant, worsening U.S.-China relations have led to the disappearance of the so-called Olympic marketing. Acknowledging criticism over Beijing's alleged human rights abuses against the Uyghur minority and the repression of democracy in Hong Kong, official IOC sponsors are passive in their use of the games in advertising. Coca-Cola, a century-long partner of the Games, has reportedly dropped its global Olympic campaign and will only promote the Games in China. South Korea's only official Olympic partner, Samsung Electronics, is sharing the same headache as well. The tech giant had no choice but to scale back its domestic promotions for the Tokyo Games due to soured Korea-Japan relations, and it is now stuck between Beijing and Washington. Experts say firms are in a tricky situation. Because of the recent movement toward firms having social objectives as well as economic objectives, they do not really want to be linked with human rights abuses that the United States and European countries accuse China of doing. Walking a tightrope between the U.S. and China, corporate partners need to be careful not to slip on the ice this Winter Olympics. Song Yujin, Arirang News. Now it's time for On Point, where we speak to experts to delve deeper into the biggest news stories in the spotlight right now. It was a tale of two deeply different fortunes last week for America's tech giants as they posted their respective results for the fourth quarter of last year. Amazon, Apple and Google's parent company Alphabet beat expectations as their profits and earnings soared. Tesla also bested expectations in the final three months of 2021 across basically all of their metrics. However, it was a quarter to forget for Mark Zuckerberg's Facebook recently renamed Meta. It saw its shares tumble more than 20 percent in extended trading last Wednesday after the disappointing earnings. It was so bad that Zuckerberg saw his own personal net worth evaporate to the tune of around 30 billion U.S. dollars in a day. For more on where this leaves the U.S. tech titans as we head deeper into 2022, we connect to Yang jun Sok, professor of economics at the Catholic University of Korea. Good morning, Professor Yang. Good morning. So we have to start with Meta, as that was the company garnering all the headlines last week. So why is Facebook slash Meta being slammed so hard? And do you think this bodes badly for the future of Zuckerberg's corporation? Okay, well, before we start on individual companies, we should comment on how current economic environment affects tech companies in general. Tech company stocks are usually classified as growth stocks. The current profitability of the company may underestimate the future profitability since the company is still growing. But in order to grow, the company needs to invest and expand, and that requires low interest rates. So under the low interest rate, as we had in the last few years, growth stocks, uh, tech stocks uh, do very well well. Investors assume companies will invest and expand to grow and raise productivity. So we've seen uh, virtually all tech companies grow very quickly. Uh, but if interest rates rise, growth stocks are the first to get hit and it gets hit hard because the Fed and other advanced countries are now expected to raise their interest rates. Investors are re-examining growth stocks and tech companies. Analysts are advising investors to no longer blindly invest in tech companies, but examine individual strengths and weaknesses. Uh, so rising interest rates will hit different firms differently, and that's what we seem to be seeing here. For Facebook, the biggest problem is the slowdown of the growth of new users. Uh, for, in fact, Facebook uh, 
lost daily users for the first time in its 18-year history. Uh, some analysts uh, suggest that Facebook is now globally saturated and it'll be difficult to add new viewers, uh, new users. Similar effects were seen with Net stock, uh, Netflix stock uh, earlier in January uh, when it lost more than 20% of its value as well. Uh, market reaction is in some sense understandable. Uh, new, uh, the uh, Facebook, Netflix, uh, they seem to be slowing down. But uh, you have to wonder whether the investors thought that Facebook numbers could grow forever. Uh, Facebook has 1.9 billion daily users, and that's nearly the quarter of global population. So, uh, it had to slow down eventually, um, and the uh, slowdown in membership should have been expected. Uh, but Facebook also has other problems due to uh, the spread of false information during the U.S. presidential elections and coronavirus pandemic. Facebook has been facing pu uh, public and political scrutiny, and because of its sheer size, it has been facing antitrust uh, scrutiny from antitrust authorities in U.S. and EU. In fact, one reason why Facebook ch uh, changed its name uh, to Meta was to de-emphasize Facebook, emphasize other companies within it, it, their uh, portfolio, and try to give an impression that they're heading into a new technological frontier, Metaverse, even though no one, exact, uh, no one seems to be completely sure what the Metaverse is. Uh, so uh, they're trying to get away from these problems, but Facebook by itself may be hitting a peak. Right. Well, it seems very much like uh, clear to everyone, including Mark Zuckerberg, that there aren't these new users coming into Facebook, which is probably part of the reason why he rebranded to uh, uh, Meta and tried to get into the metaverse space, metaverse space. Uh, but do you think the company executives there might be wondering now whether uh, Zuckerberg is a little bit past his sell-by date? And do you think it really is too harsh to lay the blame squarely at his feet for the way the company is generally performing right now? Well, the fundamental problem for Facebook is that it's, uh, it's so big that uh, it, can, it pretty much hit its limits. Uh, now, Mark Zuckerberg personally has not made the uh, problem uh, any easier to solve because he's faced criticism on false information on uh, Facebook and monopoly problems. Uh, Zuckerberg has failed to fully address the uh, uh, criticism or be very active in fixing the issue. So it may be harsh, but ousting Zuckerberg may be a fairly easy way to calm the critics of Facebook, but if Meta is to uh, go ahead and go into other areas, uh, they need a strong leader, and it's not clear there is a strong leader who can replace Zuckerberg. And Professor Yang, besides Meta, most of the big U.S. tech firms posted very good to excellent fourth quarter reports. And out of the big guns we've mentioned, Amazon, Apple, Google, and Tesla, which are best position to keep success rolling throughout this year as well? Well, Amazon uh, should have lost some value. Uh, during the fourth quarter, uh, Amazon act, uh, did have gains in sales, but it uh, was only 9.4%, which is the first single-digit growth that Amazon had since 2017. But they did have big profits from an investment in an electric vehicle maker, Rivian, uh, whose stocks Amazon got during an IPO in November. Uh, so because of that, uh, Amazon was uh, had a, a very strong fourth quarter earning, and that more than and the uh, growth from sales was responsible for the rise in value of Amazon. So they're uh, somewhat of a special case. Tesla is riding on the wave of environmental consciousness in Europe and U.S. Uh, as the uh, Car drivers are accelerating switchovers to electric vehicles, and the demand for electric vehicles is continuing to rise, and Tesla seems to be less affected by semiconductor out shortfall than other companies. It also helps that uh, Tesla makes a lot of its own batteries for their electric vehicles, uh, so they seem to be in a fairly good position, but Tesla is having some growth problems as they increase production. Uh, some of their quality controls have been... Uh, 
uh, having some problems in 2021. Uh, but Tesla, because of the increasing demand for electric vehicles, are probably going to do well. Alphabet, which owns Apple, uh, excuse me, Alphabet, which owns Google, has been doing well in part because uh, Apple's new operating system has stronger protection against tracking, which leads to more ads being viewed on Google and less ads being viewed on Facebook, which accounted for as part of that Facebook loss. And perhaps more importantly, Alphabet has announced 20 to 1 stock split to take place in July, which tends to drive up the prices of tech stocks as it did it for Apple in 2015 and 2020. Okay, wonderful, Professor Yang. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but we're grateful for your insights as always, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Turning now to our coverage of the Beijing Winter Olympics, South Korea on Tuesday won its first medal of the Games, Kim min Sok securing bronze in speed skating. Figure skater Cha jun hwan achieved a personal best in the short program of the men's single event. Han Sung-woo has a roundup. It took a while, but South Korea's very first medal at the Beijing Winter Olympics has finally arrived. Kim min Sok speed skated his way to bronze on Tuesday, racing the men's 1,500 meter with a time of just over a minute and 44 seconds to finish behind two Dutch skaters, Thomas Kroll and world record holder Kilt Nauis, who broke the Olympic record to win gold. Kim's achievement marks the second time an Asian has ever medaled in the event, the first time also his, a bronze on home ice four years ago in Pyeongchang. In figure skating, the 2022 Four Continents champion, Korea's very own Cha Jun-wan, finished fourth in Beijing 2022's men's singles short program, scoring his personal best of 99.51 to smoothly advance onto the free skating competition slated for Thursday. Dancing to the tune of Fate of the Clockmaker by Eternal Eclipse, the 20-year-old flawlessly executed the quadruple salco, triple lutz and triple loop combination, as well as the triple axle, much to the joy of his coach, Brian Orser. First place went to Nathan Chen, who set a new world record of just under 114 to score much higher than defending and double Olympic champion Yuzuru Hanyu of Japan, who finished eighth. Meanwhile, on snow, cabbage boy Lee Sang-ho failed to make it to the semis of the men's parallel giant slalom in snowboarding, an event he won the silver medal in at Pyeongchang 2018. Yi was knocked out in the quarterfinals by the slimmest of margins, losing by just one hundredth of a second to the Russian Olympic Committee's Victor Wilde. Korean short track speed skaters are eyeing Wednesday as a chance to redeem themselves after a succession of controversial disqualifications on Monday and show the world that when the world talks short track, the world talks South Korea. The men's 1,500-meter event will take place starting with the quarterfinals at 8 p.m., all the way to the final at 10.20. The women's 1,000-meters heats and the semifinals of the women's 3,000-meter relay await as well. All three events are races Korea has claimed gold in several times in the past. Han sung -woo. Arirang News. U.S. figure skater Nathan Chen on Tuesday shattered the world record for the men's short program. The 22-year-old skated his way to a total of 113.97 points. This beats the previous world record set by a Japanese two-time Olympic gold medalist by more than two points. Chen performed to La Boheme mas masterfully, executing a quad flip and triple axle, as well as other highly advanced techniques. After the performance, Chen said he was elated and grateful for every opportunity. Chen is hot favorite to win the gold medal when he next takes to the ice Thursday for the free skate part of the program. 
Natalie Geisenberger has cemented her legacy as the greatest female luger of all time as the German on Tuesday won her first gold medal in Beijing. The 34-year-old topped the women's single competition with a combined time of 3 minutes 53.454 seconds, setting a new Olympic record in the process. She becomes the first woman to win three successive Olymp Olympic singles titles following her previous victories in Pyeongchang and Sochi. Her feat is all the more impressive considering it's only been six months since she returned to action after having a baby. And now we cross over to our Oo Young for global insight and an in-depth look at important developments in world affairs. Thanks very much, Morgan. It is indeed time for Global Insight, where we speak with experts from around the world on issues making headlines. With just one month left until South Koreans vote for their 20th president, the front-running candidates are now clarifying their positions on the biggest domestic and foreign policy issues that the country is faced with. Today, we take a look at the major pledges made by the leading presidential hopefuls, zooming in on their foreign policies in particular. For this, we connect with Kim byung -ju, professor at the Hanguk University of Foreign Studies in Seoul, and Ramon Pacheco Pardo, head of department and professor of international relations at the Department of European and International Studies at King's College London. Very warm welcome to you both. Thank you for joining us again. Um, well, let's begin with you, Professor Kim, joining us on the phone. Uh, the two front-running candidates, the ruling Democratic parties, Lee Jae-myung and the main opposition People Power parties, Yoon so -go, they seem to be offering very similar pledges on the biggest domestic issues. Why do the campaign pledges look so similar this year and where can we find key differences? Well, that is because Korean politics is not as so much polarised as in other countries like the United States. For instance, United, United States, their politics is so polarized between the between the two different sizes. Uh, what you really have to focus on is voter mobilization. You gotta make sure that people who vote, who support you will actually come and come to the ballots and then, and then vote. So for that, what you have to do is you have to uh, show kind of stark different, uh, you know, very different kinds of policies from your opponents. Here in Korea, on the other hand, it's different. Right now, what we see is rather than the voters uh, divided by half, like United States, it's it's different here. It's uh, as much as we say these days, over 30 percent of the Korean voters are still not so decided, not much decided in terms of how whom they're going to vote for, and we call them centrist voters. And these voters can vote uh, either side. And so what? That's exactly what you have to target, what you have to focus on. You have to win those centrist voters. And in order to win those centrist voters, you have to come up with these policy proposals that will appeal to them. And when both sides try the same, we see this kind of uh, a similar policy pledges coming out of uh, both sides. So, for instance, you know, like the last Thursday debate that we saw, the first presidential debate this time among the four candidates, we saw their policies, for example, the first topic that they talked about was real estate policy. They Both sides, they said, uh, they have to focus on supply expansion, uh, and, you know, grow, growing supplies, increasing supplies in order to deal with the situation. About the job market, job creation, they were all talking about, you know, how they should encourage young people uh, to find the creative new businesses and new kinds of jobs. They are all talking about science and technology policy, where government wants to take a more active role. They are all talking about expanding faster train services to cover the, the country as a whole in infrastructure debate. Welfare policy, they are all agreeing on the need for pension reform. So 
those, you know, they, they were all agreeing on most of the major political pledges as we just went over here. The only area we, we noticed a difference between two major candidates was foreign policy side. So uh, that's our observation so far. And Professor Kim, well, of course, we have the two minor candidates as well, the uh, minor uh, leftist justice parties, uh, Shim Sang Jung and the uh, centrist minor uh, oppositions, and Tosu of the People's Party. What kind of agendas are they trying to push forward? And also, why is the South Korean public so fixated with the two major political parties, despite being disillusioned by them both? Yeah, setting aside two major leading candidates, An Chol Su, the third one, I guess, who show uh, numbers like somewhere between 10 to 15 percent of the uh, the, the polls. Uh, he, the, the the one who comes from the who represent People's Party, uh, he focuses seems to focus on science and technology policy. He has introduced a long list of uh, actions, government actions that will. Uh, take place, you know, to support Korea's growth in science and technology. And he sums up his policy pledge, uh, what he called 555 pledge. Uh, he wants to make sure that at least five major new businesses will grow to the top world leading level coming from Korea. And he wants to uh, see, he wants to help at least five companies here in Korea to grow to the size of Samsung Electronics. And then he wants to uh, help Korea becoming one of the uh, world's major top five economies in the world. So he called it 555, which are not that different from other leading candidates there. The fourth one, Shim Sang Jung, who represents Justice Party, she is the real progressive uh, candidate and she has been around for a long time and very well experienced, but the smallest among the, 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 the four uh, candidates in terms of the the poll numbers and so on. She talks about being a, a progressive candidate. He, she talks about four day week, four day, a four work day week, which is quite radical from Korean standard because we just had moved on to five day work, uh, work week in a full scale quite recently, if you will. And she was talking about the annual leave of 25 days, achieving that kind of system. And she also talks about uh, government guarantees for everybody in Korea to have their jobs that they like. That's very, very ambitious plan as well. But also she talks about the reforming of the medical uh, insurance system, which seems to be quite centrist in a way, making it more rational. And she talks about her political side, making parliament, national assembly, more center of the political operation, reducing the power and scope of the presidential system, and then switch, shifting more power to the parliament. So those are the policy uh, proposals coming from the third candidate on and the fourth candidate, Sim Sang Jung here. Mm. And well, Professor Pacheco Pardo, now, how do you think the two front running candidates are going to position themselves when it comes to uh, geopolitics, when it comes to these uh, very um, dynamic times in the uh, Indo-Pacific region where we're seeing a lot of tension and a lot of rivalry between the major powers? I think if we look at their uh, platforms, uh, I would expect a continuation of some of the policies that uh, has introduced. So, uh, in a way, I think it has been quite clear that he has been more willing to cooperate uh, with the US, especially since uh, President Biden took office. There uh, has been more willing to cooperate with the Quad countries, for example, issues such as uh, vaccines, but also with broader coalitions of democratic countries. So, for example, if we look at semiconductors, tech in general, there's this talk about Korea, along with other countries in the Indo-Pacific, along with European countries, of course, uh, with the US as well, uh, trying to form coalitions. Uh, and, and I think that there might be a slight difference in how critical uh, the Conservative Party candidate Jun suk yeol might be willing to be of China, or openly critical, I should say. Uh, but I think in terms of actual policy, uh, I would assume that any of the two uh, leading candidates, Jun suk yeol or Lee Chim Yong, who wins the election, uh, they will continue to distance themselves from China, as South Korea has been doing over the past couple of years. And the other aspect that I think uh, will become more prominent, uh, whoever wins the, the election, uh, is that they will 
try to work in minilateral coalitions. There's a lot of talk about uh, multilateralism, but uh, let's face it, we have these minilateral coalitions of uh, democratic countries coming together, trying to come with economic policies, security policies. And I think that South Korea will be part of those minilaterals regardless of who wins the election. So it looks like there won't be a radical departure from the current uh, trajectory of foreign policy that the current government is pursuing. But Professor Pacheco Pardo, now I understand that you carried out a survey um, of the two uh, top candidates on their uh, foreign policy towards the European Union in particular. And well, there seem to be more similarities than differences in both uh, candidates, uh, Yun and Lee's positions on relations with Europe. But what stood out to you the most? Yes, we asked the, the HMEON cam campaign and the Union Europe campaign about their views about cooperation with uh, the EU, with NATO, with European countries in general, uh, which it was the first time that the candidates were asked these questions uh, before the, the, the election. Uh, and we see a couple of similarities. Uh, I think the first one is there is this wish to diversify relations, uh, not to be too dependent on the uh, alliance with the US, which of course will remain the cornerstone of South Korean foreign policy. But this idea that uh, Korea has to cooperate with other partners uh, across the world, uh, which uh, share similar values. And here you have, of course, the European Union and European countries such as uh, France, uh, Germany, the UK or, or Spain, uh, for example. And I would say a second uh, similarity is uh, this focus on, on, on economics, uh, this focus on economic cooperation, areas such as tech uh, that Professor uh, Kim was talking about at the domestic level. So this idea that there can be cooperation with other countries that uh, share values uh, with Korea and that also very technologically advanced uh, to develop new new technologies, let's say, for example, uh, 6G uh, in the area of robotics, for example, vaccines uh, for uh, potential pandemics in the future. So, so there is this similarity. There might be a slight difference in that I think the Yoon uh, campaign uh, made clear that when it comes to security, uh, they would be willing to more openly cooperate, uh, cooperate on such as, as uh, cyber and maritime security uh, with NATO and with key European countries as well as the European Union. Uh, and the HMO campaign uh, maybe thinking, considering whether this is something that is in the interest of Korea if they win the election or whether they want to follow uh, a different path. And Professor Pacheco Pade, now how about the minor parties led by Shin Sang Jong and, and Choi Su? They still seem to lack sufficient support from the public to be taken seriously compared to the two major candidates. Do you think they need a more developed foreign policy platform? I, I, I think at the end of the day, voters uh, in Korea, like any other country in the world, they focus more on, on domestic issues. Uh, having said that, uh, obviously there are two foreign policy issues that are domestic uh, in the case of, of, of Korea. Uh, one of them, of course, relations with uh, North Korea. And the other one, uh, the U.S. alliance, and by definition, the triangular relationship between the U.S., China, and, and, and Korea uh, itself. So I, I think it would make sense to express more quickly a the policy towards uh, North Korea, even though this is something that, of course, has been raised in in the previous uh, um, presidential, uh, in the previous uh, presidential debate, and it might be raised in, in future debates that are coming up. But also, how do they see the relationship between uh, Korea and the U.S. and uh, the worsening, really, relations uh, with China, which we're seeing even this week during the Olympics uh, taking place in, in Beijing. But this really goes back to the past uh, two, three years, or even to the deployment of, of, of that and the reaction of. Of China. So I think it would make sense to discuss these issues, which, as I said, even though in theory they are foreign policy issues, for also some purposes they have become domestic issues because they don't impact uh, South Korean policy uh, very strongly. And well, we're almost out of time, I'm afraid, but Professor Kim, before we go, now both uh, front running candidates have been rather unpopular with the Korean public. What do you think will be the decisive factor when South Koreans make their choice on March 9th? I would say the upcoming presidential debate. In my understanding, we have three remaining. Uh, the, the second one, the, the first among the three starting, as I mentioned, two days from now, Friday. And because we have centrist voters, uh, we'll be closely watching 
uh, how they define their initiatives and policy, you know, policy pledges further more clearly. And uh, in doing so, of course, uh, the negative campaign tactics will backfire. Uh, we saw evidence the last time that people like that candidates didn't try really negative campaign tactics last time in the first debate. Uh, so that's something they should keep in mind. And they all have to show sort of human touch. It's not always the best debater wins the debate. Uh, someone who can approach the borders with good feeling on the emotional side, that matters as well. So that will be a very important factor. And in doing so, in the same lines, kind of showing their sincere care for the people and national interest and public interest and so on. So how you, you reach out to the voters, uh, to their hearts, uh, in the remaining three uh, presidential debates, I think they will largely determine who's going to win in this election, which is only about, what, three weeks' time, considering the early votes, uh, early voting starts at March 4th and 5th. Uh, so that's that's very short time, uh, not much time uh, remaining in on our watch. Just a month left to go. Well, that was Kim byung -ju, professor at the Hanguk University of Foreign Studies in Seoul, and Ramon Pacheco Pardo at King's College London. Thank you both so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. French President Emmanuel Macron says Russian President Vladimir Putin told him during their marathon talks in Moscow this week that Russia will not further escalate the Ukraine crisis. Macron made the remarks Tuesday during a visit to Kiev, although the Kremlin denies the two leaders struck a deal to that end. The French leader also said the leaders of Russia and Ukraine told him they were both committed to the principles of the 2014 peace agreement, also known as the Minsk Accord. He added steps can be taken to de-escalate the crisis, calling on all sides to stay calm. By most metrics, the South Korean economy is recovering from the pandemic-triggered downturn. However, local manufacturers are still seeing their inventories pile up. Watchers say this is mostly the result of ongoing glut in global supply chains. Kim Chang-ha tells us more. According to a report released by the Bank of Korea on Tuesday, the inventories of local manufacturers have risen since the third quarter of last year, particularly in automobile parts, chips, metals, petroleum and chemical products. A Bank of Korea official explained that while generally inventory levels can drop during an economic recovery as demand increases, the recent pileup was due to a continued blockage in the global supply chain as well as the ongoing pandemic. For example, with an insufficient supply of non-memory semiconductors from Southeast Asia, automobile production has been affected. In turn, the demand for intermediary products manufactured by South Korean firms has also taken a significant hit. In addition, supplies of local petroleum and chemical products have been piling up because of a rise in global raw material prices, not to mention the spread of Omicron, which has caused people to travel much less. The BOK has forecast that relief from the global supply chain issue and the pandemic will help stabilize the current inventory situation. Meanwhile, the increase in energy and raw materials prices has put pressure on the global economy, with fears that oil may hit the $100 per barrel mark. With that, the Hyundai Research Institute forecasts that South Korea's economic growth will fall by 0.3 percentage points if global oil prices do pass that threshold, and inflation will rise by 1.1 percentage points as South Korea relies heavily on crude. As of 2020, South Korea's economic dependence on oil ranked first out of the 37 OECD member countries, standing at 5.7 barrels per $10,000 of the GDP. Kim Chang-ha. Arirang News. Now let's take a look at what's going on in the world now. For this, we have our Eason Jay joining us from the Arirang Newsroom. Good morning. Good morning to you guys. So the United States has posted a massive bounty on the leader of the Islamic State group. Who is he and how much are we looking at? 
Well, the U.S. announced on Monday that it's offering a reward of up to 10 million U.S. dollars for information uh, leading to the identification or location of ISIS-K leader Sanola Ghaffari. Now, in addition to that, up to $10 million for information leading to the arrest of those responsible for the deadly August 2021 attack at Kabul airport. So who is Ghaffari? Well, the ISIS-K leader rose to power to lead the group and is responsible for approving all ISIS-K operations throughout Afghanistan and arranging funds to conduct operations. Now, in November, the U.S. State Department designated Ghaffari as a specially designated global terrorist. The hunt for Ghaffari comes as a single Islamic State a suicide bomber killed 13 U.S. troopers and at least 170 Afghans at Kabul airport during the mass evacuation last, uh, last August. Now, at least 11 people were killed and 35 others injured as a massive landslide covered several homes in central Colombia on Tuesday. According to the country's disaster management agency, the incident took place at Dosque Brades after heavy rain in the surrounding coffee-growing province. Authorities have evacuated dozens of homes as the nearby Oton River has overflowed. Now, landslide-related incidents are not uncommon in the South American nation due to mountainous terrain, frequent heavy rain, and poor construction of housing. Now, hundreds of trucks were seen driving down Main Street in Bangkok on Tuesday to protest against high diesel prices. The convoy of truckers headed towards Thailand's energy ministry, hoping to pressure the government to cap the price of diesel at 25 baht per liter or around 76 cents, while also calling for the resignation of the country's energy minister. I'm a truck driver transporting goods between Bangkok and Chiang Mai. The fuel used to cost around 7,000 to 8,000 baht for this route, but it increased over 10,000 baht. We have to give up profits to cover fuel costs, so I'm here asking the government to help. Now, of course, the uh, spokesperson for the ministry speaking to Reuters on Tuesday said the government could not meet the demands of truck drivers, saying the government has already pegged the price of diesel at 30 baht or 91 cents since last October amid rising global fuel prices. Good morning. If you liked yesterday's bearable temperatures, you're going to also enjoy today's conditions. Much of Korea will experience temperatures above norms, which could lead to a wide gaps in readings between lows and highs, nearly 15 degrees Celsius in certain parts of the country. But it's that very unpleasant ultra-fine dust that will be high in parts of Korea. South of Gyeonggi-do and Chungcheong Namdo provinces will have high levels of ultra-fine dust throughout the day today. Well, air quality is normal for now, but stagnant airflow will increase dust levels, while eastern regions are still under dry alerts. Morning temperatures are similar to slightly higher than the same time yesterday, Busan at 2 degrees. Afternoon highs will be 2 to 4 degrees higher than seasonal norms, Tejun and Jeju topping out at 9 degrees Celsius this afternoon. While temperatures will continue to rise gradually along the dust levels across Korea. With that, here's a look at the weather conditions around the world. And that's all we have for now. We'll be back at 8 a.m. Korea time on Thursday for our next edition of New Day at Arirang. We appreciate you tuning in. I'm Kim Mogan. And I'm Mark Brim. Thank you, as always, for joining us. Until next time, goodbye.